Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this December 2021 virtual meeting of the Developmental and Reproductive Toxicant Identification Committee. I'm Lauren Zeiss. I'm director of the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. Um, today's meeting, the committee is going to be considering um, two major items. First, the male reproductive toxicity of perfluoronononanoic acid or PFNA and its salts. And then secondly, perfluorodecanoic acid, PFDA and its salts. We'll also have um, updates and a consent item. Um, so the meeting's being transcribed and recorded. The uh, transcript will be posted on our website. Um, and now I'm going to ask Elizabeth Martyr, who's handling the logistical aspects of this meeting, um, to um, uh, go over how the public can better par best participate in the meeting. It's a reminder of, um, of uh, uh, logistics from the um, meeting agenda that went out earlier. So turn it over to you, Elizabeth. Good morning. Um, just a reminder that individuals who wish to make an oral comment at today's meeting are asked to do two things. First, please join the Zoom webinar. And second, please fill out a speaker request card. Information on how to join the Zoom webinar is shown on the slide that is currently being presented. Uh, now, go to uh, bit.ly slash register dart IC 2021, which I am currently putting in the chat as well, and register for today's Zoom webinar. You will receive a link to join the webinar at the end of the registration process. And if you provided a working email address, you will also receive an email with a link to join the webinar. Information on how to access a speaker request card is also shown on this slide. Go to bit.ly slash OWEHA Dart IC 2021 and request to speak on a specific agenda item. It is requested that your Zoom display name match the name you use to fill out the speaker request form. Individuals who have not submitted a speaker request card may also indicate their wish to make an oral comment by using the raise hand function when requested by the chair. That's in the Zoom control panel. I'll also add briefly that as, to, as regards closed captioning, for those joining the Zoom webinar, artificial intelligence AI uh, generated subtitles and a full transcript can be displayed. Um, the subtitles will be uh, visible to those joining the listening and viewing only broadcast. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Martyr. Now I'm gonna introduce the panel, the um, Developmental and Reproductive Toxicant Identification Committee. And as I introduce you, if you could um, uh, raise your hand. So we'll start with Dr. Patrick Ellard, uh, Associate Professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, Institute for Society and Genetics. Dr. Diana Ayun Kim, Executive Director, Head of GRED, Non-Clinical Operations, GNO, Safety Assessment at Genentech. Dr. Carrie Breton, Associate Professor of Population and Public Health Studies, Keck School of Medicine, University of Southern California. Dr. Hertz Picciotto, um, professor of Epidemiology and Chief Division of Environmental and Occupational Health at the University of California, Davis. Our committee chair, Dr. Ulrika Luderer, Professor of Medicine, School of Medicine, and Director, Center of, for Occupational and Environmental Health, University of California, Irvine. Dr. Aiden Nazmi, Professor of Food Science and Nutrition, at California Polytechnic State University, San Luis Obispo. Dr. Isaac Pessa, Associate Dean and Distinguished Professor, School of Veterinary Medicine, University of California, Davis. Dr. Tracy Woodruff, Professor, Development of Obst Obstetrics, 
Gynecology and Reproductive Sciences and Director of Program on Reproductive Health in the Environment, University of California, San Francisco. Okay, um, so welcome panel and thank you for your participation today. Uh, now I'll introduce OEHA staff, um, uh, starting with Dr. Dave Edwards, Chief Deputy Director. This is uh, Dr. Edwards' first meeting with us. Uh, Carol Moynihan, Chief Counsel. Dr. Vince Coliano, Deputy Director for Scientific Program. Now from the Reproductive Cancer and Hazard Assessment Branch, Dr. Martha Sandy, Branch Chief. Dr. French Francisco Moran, Acting Section Chief of the Reproductive Toxicology and Epidemiology Section and then other staff of the Reproductive Toxicology and Epidemiology section that the committee will be hearing from today. Dr. Ling Hong Lee. Good morning. Dr. Melissa, Marlissa Campbell. Dr. Yazi Nicknam. And then finally, Dr. Allegra Kim, who summarized the epidemiology studies when she was with OEHA, and she will also be presenting. And then from the Proposition 65 Implementation Program, Julian Lichty, Special Assistant for Programs and Legislation. Esther Braha Ochoa and Tyler Secho. Okay, now uh, I'll ask Carol Moynihan Cummings, OEA Chief Counsel for some introductory remarks about Bagley Keen and other legal issues related to participation in today's virtual meeting. Good morning. Um, it's good to see everybody here today. Uh, I just had a few um, points I wanted to make. First, please feel free to ask me any questions at any time during the meeting. I'm, I'll be here the whole time. Um, if I do have to step away uh, for any reason, Senior Staff Counsel Christy Morioka will cover for me. So there will be an attorney here all the time. Please remember that all discussions and deliberations for this group need to be conducted during the meeting, not on breaks, lunch, or with individual members of the committee on or offline, including via phone, email, chats, or text messages. At today's meeting, you'll be considering two chemicals for potential listing. OEHA takes no position regarding whether a chemical should be listed, though staff are available to answer questions or locate information if you need it. The governor appointed you because of your scientific expertise to be the state's qualified experts on the reproductive toxicity of chemicals. There's no need for you to feel compelled to go outside that charge. For example, you need not consider whether a warning may be required for an exposure to a chemical or any other consequences of the listing. This committee can consider human, animal, mechanistic, or other data in deciding whether a chemical has been clearly shown through scientifically valid testing according to generally accepted principles to cause reproductive toxicity. If you need more information, need more time to consider the evidence or discuss it further before you vote on a listing, there's no requirement that you make a decision today. For example, you may table the decision and take it up again at a future meeting. Feel free to ask clarifying questions of me or the other OEHA staff during the meeting. If we don't know the answer to your question, we'll do our best to find it and report it to you. Do you have any questions? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Carol. And now I'll turn the meeting over to our chair, Dr. Ulrika Luder. Thank you very much, Lauren and Carol. And good morning and welcome to all the committee members, members of the public who are joining today. We're now ready to move on to our, uh, the first of two main agenda items. And that item is consideration of perfluoronanoic acid or PFNA and its salts as known to the state to cause reproductive toxicity based on male reproductive toxicity. 
So um, I would like to, uh, having introduced the agenda item, now turn uh, the floor over to Deputy Director for Scientific Programs, Dr. Vince Coliano, to begin. Thank you, Dr. Luder. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to endorse Lauren's welcoming remarks, especially our appreciation for your service as experts on this committee. You have an important role in bringing current science to bear on decisions to benefit the health of all the people of California. We know you're here as a public service, and so to assist you, OEA has summarized the scientific evidence that you will consider. I'll now turn the screen over to Dr. Martha Sandy, Chief of our Reproductive and Cancer Hazard Assessment Branch, who will introduce the staff presentation. Martha? Thank you, Vince, and welcome and good morning to everyone. Let me provide some background on the process by which perfluoronanoic acid or PFNA and its salts was given a high priority and selected for listing consideration. PFNA was brought to the DART IC for consultation and prioritization last year in 2020, and this committee recommended that PFNA be placed in the high priority group for future listing consideration. OEA selected PFNA and its salts for consideration for listing, and in March 2021, OEA solicited from the public information relevant to the assessment of developmental and reproductive toxicity. No information was received on PNF, PFNA and its salts. OEA has focused its current review of PFNA and its salts on evidence of male reproductive toxicity. This information is summarized in the hazard identification document released in October 2021, which also includes information on PFDA and its salts which will be discussed in a separate agenda item today. The hazard identification materials on PFNA and its salts provided to the DART IC for your consideration include the hazard identification document, the references cited within it, one additional epidemiology study, and a revised table 4.1, which has been updated to include that study, and public comments received on the document. I will now ask Dr. Pancho Moran, who is currently serving as the acting chief of the Reproductive Toxicology and Epidemiology section to begin the staff presentation. And I will note that we will take a break partway through the staff presentation to provide the committee an opportunity to ask questions of clarification. Dr. Moran. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Marty. Uh, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> is the slide visible for everybody? Yes, it is. Just checking. Okay. Uh, so, uh, good morning. Uh, we will uh, present an overview of the evidence of the nerve data toxicity of perfluoronanoic acid, PFNA, and salt. This presentation will be a brief overview of data reviewed in the hazard identification document. Due to time constraints, this presentation is not able to cover every finding discussed in the HID. I would like to acknowledge that this work was a group effort from the staff in the reproductive toxicology and epidemiology section. Here on an outline of this presentation, we will start by presenting introductory information on chemical structure, use, occurrence and exposure, and the systematic literature review approach that we implemented. Next, we will summarize key pharmacokinetic information for PFNA. We will then present a brief summary of the nerve reproductive toxicity data for PFNA and salt, starting with data from whole animal studies followed by findings from human epidemiological studies. An overview of mechanistic data for PFNA will then be presented, followed by a summary of those data. The concept of the key characteristic of metrodotic toxicants will be presented, together with the key characteristics of endocrine interslapping chemicals. We will conclude the presentation with a summary of the animal and human data. PFNA and its salts are perfluorinated organic compounds with surfactant properties that belong to a group of chemicals that collectively are called per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances or PFASs. 
The chemical structure of PFNA is shown on the slide, where PFNA has a fully fluorinated nine carbon chain. The phases, including PFNA, have been used to make products resistant to stains, grease, solid, and water. PFNA and its salts have been used in fluoropolymer manufacturing, and PFNA has been detected in cosmetic products. There is limited information on the production and emission of PFNA and its salts. PFNA is a global pollutant of air, water, soil, and wildlife, and is present in the environment. Level of PFNA in Californians has been documented in several studies conducted between 2010 and 2019 by Biomonitoring California with high detection frequencies. We have conducted literature research on the developmental and reproductive toxicity of PFNA and its salts. We use HOG, Health Assessment Workplace Collaborative, as a tool for multi level screening of literature search results. Then we focus on literature relevant to male reproductive toxicity. Here we have a summary of the screening of the DART literature for PFNA with a particular focus on the literature re relevant to male reproductive reproductive toxicant. Studies identified as providing general information on PFNA are shown here on the blue box, while the studies relevant to male reproductive toxicity are highlighted by the red boxes. Note that for the human epidemiological data, the study designs were also identified. PFNA is well absorbed and binds to serum proteins. It is widely distributed through the body and in human tissues, PFNA was found principally, principally in brain, which indicates that it can cross the blood-brain barrier and in kidney with lower levels in lungs and liver. PFNA was detected in semen, coarse serum, fetal tissues, which indicate that it can cross the placenta and in breast milk. PFNA is not known to be metabolized in animals or humans, and excretion is mainly through urine and feces with a small amount are also found in nails and hair. The half-life of PFNA ranges from several years in humans to a few months in rodents. Now, Dr. Lin Hong Lee will present data from whole animal studies. Good morning. I will present an overview on the data available from whole animal studies on PFNA. This table shows five groups of male reproductive outcomes that we have data on PFNA. These are the outcomes that are generally used to assess male reproductive toxicity in animal studies. They include organ waste and histopathology, sperm production and quality, hormonal evaluation, reproductive performance, including fertility, and development of the male reproductive system. In the next few slides, I will present data on PFNA from animal studies on each of these five outcomes. Next. Next, please. We found studies on PFNA in rats, mice, and zebrafish from the literature search. All studies in rats treated the animals by gavage. Six to 10 pubertal or young adult, adults per group received the treatment daily for 14 or 28 days. Similarly, studies in mice treated the animals by oral gavage. Three studies treated the prepubertal mice, one for 90 days and two for 14 days. Two studies treated the pregnant mice during gestation, and they either evaluated the testicular effects in neonatal mice or examined developmental landmarks in male offspring. The study by John et al. treated the zebrafish with PFNA in fish tank water for a total of 180 days. Next. Reproductive organ weights were measured in studies in rats and mice. 
In rats, the NTP study included five groups of rats treated by daily gavage of PFNA from 0.625 to 10 milligram per kilogram per day. Organ weights were measured in the control and the three lower dose groups. Epidemic weight was significantly reduced in these three lower dose groups, dose dependently. The significant reduction in epidemic weight seen at 0.625 milligram per kilogram, the lowest dose used in the study occurred in the absence of any effect on body weight. Testis weight was also significantly reduced in this study. Next. In mice, two studies measured the testis weight following exposure beginning at 25 days of age. Reductions in tested weight were observed in both studies, but these reductions did not reach statistical significance. Measurements were conducted on relatively small numbers of mice per treatment group in these studies. The large reductions in tested weight in pure mice treated with PFNA could be biologically meaningful. Next. Histopathological evaluation was performed in studies in rats and mice. In rats, the NTP study, germ cell degeneration, interstitial cell atrophy, spermatid retention, and epididymal lesions were observed in PFA-treated rats. As shown from these histopathological photos taken from the NTP study report, you can clearly see dying germ cells missing layers of germ cells, and a diminished cluster of lytic cells. Next. In the studies by Fung et al., pupil rats were treated for 14 days with PFNA at doses slightly higher than those used in the NTP 28-day study. The authors found germ cell degeneration and the sloughing of the seminiferous epithelium. Using the tunnel labeling methods, the authors found an increased number of spermatocytes and spermatogonia in apoptosis. These investig investigators also observed histological lesions in Satoli cells. Germ cell degeneration has also been observed in multiple studies of pubertal adult mice treated with PFNA. In the 90-day study, the authors found germ cell degeneration in adult mice treated with 0.5 milligram per kilogram of PFNA. Next. Sperm parameters were measured in the control and the three lowest dose groups in the 28-day NTP study in rats. And in the 90-day study by CN and CN in mice. In the NTP study, Epididymal sperm count was significantly reduced in a dose-dependent manner in the second and the third lowest dose groups. In the study in mice, sperm number, motility, viability were all significantly reduced in the high dose group. Next. The hormonal effects of PFNA were assessed in rats, mice, and zebrafish. Statistically significant reduction in serum testosterone levels was found in rats and mice. In the 28-day NTP rat study, serum testosterone was measured in the control and the three lower dose groups, and the significant reduction was seen. In the 14-day rat study by Feng et al., serum testosterone was significantly reduced in the high dose group in mice. In mice, serum testosterone was significantly reduced in the 90-day study in adults in the high-dose group, and in pupil mice in a 14-day study in both dose tested. In zebrafish, serum testosterone was significantly increased at the low dose, but not at the higher doses. Significant reductions in intratesticular testosterone levels were also found in pupil mice at both those doses tested following a 14-day exposure. Next. In addition to the effects on testosterone level, increased serum levels of 
MIS and h 2 dial and the decrease the serum level of inhibin B were found in rats. There was no effect on serum FSH or LH in rats. Next. Next, please. Slide 19. There are two studies that evaluated the effects of PFA on reproductive performance. In the study in mice, the authors reported a significant reduction in litter size following mating of unexposed females with male mice at the end of the 90-day dosing period. But the detailed information on the study design was not presented in the paper. In the 180-day study in zebrafish, the authors reported a significant reduction in egg hatching rates at the lowest and the highest concentrations. However, both female and male fish were exposed to PFNA, making it difficult to determine if this effect was male mediated. Next. There are two studies in mice assess the effect of PFNA on development of the male reproductive system following prenatal exposure. In the study by Das et al., the authors found significant delays in prepucial separation in prenatally exposed male mice in the low and high dose groups. In the study by C and C, the authors treated pregnant mice from gest gestational day 12 to birth, and they examined the testes in neonatal mice on postnatal day three. Major findings from this study will be presented in the next two slides. Next. The authors reported no effects on testes weight or histology. However, based on the, this histopathological pictures, the authors presented in the paper as shown on this slide, the diameter of seminiferous cores from PFNA-treated mice appear to be smaller. This apparent histopathological changes suggest reduced the sertoli cell population. The authors reported a 20 to 30% reduction in the testis weight, which did not reach statistical significance. Since the neonatal testis mainly consists of proliferating sertoli cells, reduction in testis weight in neonatal mice indicate reduced the number of sertoli cells. The authors found the testicular protein level of PCAA was significantly reduced. Taken together, these findings suggest the inhibition of sertoli cell proliferation after the prenatal exposure to PFNA. Proliferation of sertoli cells in neonates determines the number of sertoli cells in adult animals, and each sertoli cell can only nurture a certain number of germ cells in the adult. Reduced the sertoli cell proliferation in neonates could result, result in reduced sperm production in the adult. Therefore, effects on sertoli cell proliferation during the perinatal period needed to be considered carefully. Next. In the same study, the authors found Intratesticular testosterone levels were reduced. Testicular levels of several proteins involved in key steps in steroid genesis were also reduced. Testosterone production by lytical cells in neonates is critical for germ cell development. That concludes my presentation on PFNA. Great. All right. Thank you, Dr. Thank Lee. You. Uh, now we have uh, time for questioning from the Dark IC members, if they decide. All right, um, Dart IC members, if you, if anyone has any questions, um, please 
use the raise hand um, method, um, or you can also wave your actual hand. So I see that Dr. Pessa has a clarifying question. I'll start with, with you, and I see that others also do. Hi, thank you. Um, I was wondering, did any of the studies you just presented uh, provide quantitative levels of uh, the uh, PFNA in the serum or in the tissues? Uh, uh, the NTP study, I'll, I'll take, uh, um, um, I'll uh, try to respond and we'll go back to check on the NTP report more carefully, come back to you, um, Dr. Pesa. The NTP study measured the serum levels of PFNA in serum. And I, I don't think they measured the PFNA level in testicular tissues. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Breton. Hi, um, thanks. In the last study that you were just presenting with the um, intratesticular testosterone levels, I was wondering whether they also looked at circulating testosterone or serum testosterone and just, it'd be helpful if, if they happen to have any correlation between <clears throat> the intratesticular levels of testosterone and the circulating levels. Was that looked at at all? No, they only presented the data on intratesticular okay. T level. Okay, thanks. All right, Dr. Woodruff. Hi, I was uh, interested in the figures that you showed on your literature search and that you were using Hawk for the literature search tools. So I don't recall the little spider diagram being in the document. So that's why I was asking for the slides. And I was wondering, maybe I'm gonna talk about this in, um, when we go into the main comments, but I'd like to hear maybe at the end of the presentations, your plans for using Hawk more completely in terms of being able to add in the quantitative information from the studies, I think that would be of great use to the committee for reviewing this. And are you making the literature review component in Hawk public? Uh, Aren't you, what do you like? Yeah, okay. Yes, yes, yeah, of course. Uh, no, at this point, we are not making it public, uh, but probably we are in the process, this is a, uh, early attempts of using this uh, uh, tool for uh, our systematic literature review. Uh, so we are in the, in the progress of adding more features to it as, as convenient for our uh, studies. You know, for, so. Right, but I guess I would encourage the state to make that literature space, because you could make those projects public on Hawk, And I really think that that would be very useful as a public service tool. Yes, I, I think we need to talk about that internally because the Proc 65 may have some limitations on. on yeah, I, this is Martha Sandy. So yes. thank you, um, Tracy, uh, Dr. Woodruff for your comments and we'll take those under consideration. And we'll, we can talk about this later. Um, okay, thanks. Dr. hertz Pizziotto, did you have a question? Uh, you're muted. There we go. Okay. So um, this is actually sort of a broader question, and I, <clears throat> I, um, I, I, and I'm not sure about this. So the products in which PFNA is used, do those also uh, typically include other um, uh, other perfluoro uh, 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 other PFAs, and um, and I guess what I'm really getting at is whether there's been any studies looking at mixtures in which PFNA would be one component. Um, sure. Concern being that we uh, do always test things one by one. And as we know, that's not realistic and, uh, you know, tends to, it could be masking uh, effects that are more a result of, of a mixture. So that's my question. This is, this is Martha, Sandy. Um, thank you for that question. It's a good question. Um, 
it's very difficult for us to uh, to find information on current use of PFNA. Um, we do know from biomonitoring studies that we're exposed to it, um, but we and, and we focus on our hazard identification documents on testing of the chemical that we're considering. Um, so we have not focused on looking at mixture studies and I don't recall that we found any. There, there may have been one. I'll turn to Dr. Moran if he remembers anything. Yes, uh, as, as a common practice, we try to avoid in animal studies at the least, you know, uh, mixtures because you know, we are trying to list one particular chemical, not a class, not a mixture. So when we run into that, those type of studies, we save it as a normal uh, background information, but we concentrate on, on, we can call it clean studies with one single chemical applied at a time. Uh, and on epi studies, of course, that is impossible. So the answer is yes, we are exposed to a mixture, but for animal studies, we concentrate on a single chemical at a time. Thank you. I'm not seeing any additional raised hands, so I believe we can go continue with the um, staff presentations. I see. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, next, uh, Dr. Allegra Kim will discuss epidemiological studies of PFNA that examine male reproductive outcomes. Dr. Kim. You may be muted, uh, Alka. Dr. Kim, if you're uh, able to unmute yourself and talk, otherwise we'll go to plan B. Elizabeth, can you uh, see? Ah. Uh, Dr. Kim is unmuted. Um, she's asking for a moment, please. Hello, can you hear me now? We can, thank you, oh, Dr. Kim. I don't, I don't know what changed because I didn't do anything <laughs> since our test. Anyway, um, I apologize for that. Good morning. Um, as is common with, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? As is common with studies as a male reproductive endpoint, many studies of PFNA were cross-sectional in design. There were also some prospective cohort and case control studies. A noteworthy methodological issue is that compared to two other PFASs, PFOA and PFOS, the measured PFNA concentrations in serum or plasma, plasma in these studies were very low, often close to one nanogram per milliliter. In addition, the studies generally had low sensitivity. That is, within study populations, the differences between the lowest and highest PFNA concentrations within studies was small. And finally, all population samples have multiple chemical exposures and in particular, multiple PFAS exposures. As in the HID, the findings I will report are statistically significant unless otherwise stated. Next slide, please. OEHA identified 18 studies that examined male reproductive outcomes. The most studied outcomes were of male reproductive function and I will talk more about those later. Um, there were also two studies that examined the effect of maternal PFNA exposure on the developmental landmark anogenital distance in male offspring. The findings from these studies were inconsistent, with one study finding an increase and the other finding a decrease in anogenital distance. 
And there were two studies of prostate cancer or prostate-specific antigen as a marker for prostate cancer. These studies found no associations with PFNA. Next slide. The next few slides will focus on outcomes of reproductive function, starting with reproductive hormones. Decreased serum testosterone levels were associated with higher PFNA concentrations in serum, plasma, or semen in several studies of younger boys and men. These findings were in studies of prepubescent boys at age six to nine years old, in 13 to 15 year old boys, in young men being considered for military service with a median age of 19 years, and in men visiting a reproductive health center. In this last study, the association was strongest in men under 30. Other studies, most of which had small sample size or low serum PFNA with median concentrations near or below one nanogram per milliliter, reported no associations or inconsistent results. No consistent associations were seen with PFNA and other reproductive hormones or related proteins. Next slide, please. A cross-sectional study using data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, NHANES, reported that a doubling of serum PFNA was associated with a 16.3% higher concentration of thyroid-stimulating hormone in males 12 to less than 20 years old. Associations with other thyroid hormones were not observed. Next slide, please. The study with the highest PFNA concentration reported a substantial and dose-dependent reduction in sperm concentration in the second and third tertiles, with a 25% reduction in the third tertile. A dose-dependent reduction in sperm count was also observed, although the reductions did not reach statistical significance. Uh, findings on sperm morphology and or sperm motility were inconsistent. Next slide, please. Sperm DNA integrity was examined in two studies with contrasting population samples. Infertile men were overrepresented in the study by Pan et al. and underrepresented in the study by Specht et al. Effects were seen by Pan et al., but not Specht et al. These effects were an increase in the percentage of sperm with high DNA stainability, which is an indicator of the percent of sperm with immature chromatin, and an increase in the DNA fragmentation index. In the one study to examine IVF, IVF outcomes, no associations with adverse effects were observed. I will now hand the presentation over to Dr. Murat. Thank you, Dr. Kim. So in this section, so we will present an overview of the mechanistic evidence on the effect on the hypothalamus, pituitary gonadal, or liver axis, and the effect on the thyroid and thyroid hormones. I would like to emphasize that this is an overview of the mechanistic data, and I refer to you to the HID for discussion for additional study findings. I would like to start with a brief review on the physiology of the hypothalamus, pituitary gonadal axis. Gonotropin releasing hormone, GnRH, produced by the hypothalamus, stimulates the pituitary to release gonotropins, luteinizing hormone or LH, and follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, that will stimulate the gonads to produce gametes and hormones such as testosterone inhibitor D and mulyron inhibitor substance. The effect of EFNA on reproductive hormones in humans and whole animal have already been presented. For in vitro endocrine effect of PFNA, we have that in culture primary sertoli cells isolated from eight weeks of what PFNA exposure resulted in increase in mulyron inhibiting substance messenger levels and decrease in inhibiting B uh, messenger levels. In a mouse latent cell tumor line, treatment with PFNA resulted in a concentration dependent decrease in the production of progesterone. In the next three slides, I will summarize PFNA's effect on the expression, binding, and or activity of HPG-related hormone receptors. The studies in vivo, in, in mice, uh, reported uh, that PFNA re reduced androgen receptor messenger levels 
and in male silverfish, EFNA reduced gonadotropin receptor messenger levels in the gonads. Reduce estrogen receptor alpha and beta messengers in silverfish brain at the low and at, at the low dose and increase messenger levels at the higher dose. Also reduce androgen receptor uh, messenger levels in the brain and increase liver messenger messenger level for estrogen receptor alpha and beta were reported. In rainbow trout cyt liver cytosol, FNA displayed very weak competitive binding with estrogen to estrogen receptor alpha. In primary rat cells culture, FNA exposure resulted in a reduction in messenger levels of FSH receptor and FNA had no effect on androgen receptor messenger levels. In a Chinese hamster's over cell line, FNA had no antigen receptor agonistic activity. However, FNA did exhibit concentration dependent antagonistic effect on the high dose testosterone DHT induced androgen receptor transactivation. In MBO line cells, a human breast adenocarcinoma cell line, FNA had no effect on estrogen receptor transactivation. And in in a separate experiment, FNA was found to inhibit the estrogenic response to estradiol in a concentration-dependent manner. In MCF7 cells, another human breast adenocarcinoma cell line, co-treatment with estradiol and FNA resulted in down-regulated expression of two estrogen-responsive genes. In a human embryonic kidney cell line, FNA induced human estrogen receptor alpha gene reported activity by two and a half fold. In silico studies reported that DFNA is predicted to bind at the active site of human, mouse, and child estrogen receptor alpha, and is predicted also to bind to the surface of the estradiol activated form of the human receptor, estrogen receptor alpha. The studies in mice and several fish indicate that DFNA has effect on two regulatory proteins involved in early step in stereogenesis esterogenic factor 1, uh, SF1, and esterogenic acute regulatory protein, or STAR. PFNA reduced protein expression of SF1 in the testes of pupural mice and in mice exposed in utero and evaluated in postnatal day 3. And also reduced STAR messengers and protein levels in the testes of mice in multiple studies DFNA also increased messenger level of a star in several fish gonads. Here we have a summary of the enzymatic steps involved in estrogenesis. Sex steroids like progesterone, testosterone, or estradiol in the gonads are produced from cholesterol in a series of sequential enzymatic reactions. There are two main types of enzymes in this pathway. First, the p 450 is highlighted by the red boxes and the hydroxysteroid and dehydrogenase HHDs in the blue boxes. Remember this because we will use this schematic representation to present data on the effect of PFNA on estrogenesis. PFNA reduced messengers and protein of P450 side change cleavage enzyme in mice and increased messenger in several fish. There were reduction in the messenger and protein expression of 3 beta HHD in mice and several fish. For P450 C17, there were unclear effects in rats and no effect on several fish. There was a reduction in messenger and protein expression of 17 beta HHD in mice and increased messenger levels in several fish. PFNA exposure resulted in an increase in aromatase expression in several fish and has no effect on an aromatase activity in a human placenta choriocarcinoma cell line. Now, Dr. Melissa Campbell will present data on thyroid hormones. Thank you. You can read the slide, Pancho. Uh, thank you. Just a, a brief introduction. The thyroid hormones T3 and T4 are produced and secreted by the thyroid gland in response to the regulatory hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH from the pituitary gland 
and thyrotropin releasing hormone TRH from the hypothalamus. Once secreted, T4 can be converted to T3 or to reverse T3, represented as RT3, which is an inactive isomer of T3. Circulating T4 and T3 can either be bound to carrier proteins or unbound, also called free. Measurements of serum thyroid hormone levels are typically referred to either as free, which is the unbound only, or total, which consists of the bound as well as the free. Thyroid hormones regulate basal meta metabolic rate as well as exerting control over growth development and differentiation of many cells and organ systems, including the testis. Thyroid hormone receptors have been identified on testicular cells and T3 binds directly to receptors on Sertoli cells. Binding of T3 to the receptors on Sertoli cells activates gene transcription and protein synthesis, as well as Sertoli cell proliferation and differentiation, and is suspected to have a role in initiating spermatogenesis. While there are contradictory reports as to how thyroid hormone acts on Leydig as well as Sertoli cells and testes, proposed mechanisms suggest a role for T3 in stimulating basal testosterone generation. Despite some inconsistencies among studies, as well as species differences, reviews of thyroid hormones in male reproduction and infertility found indications that short-term hypothyroidism in post-pubertal males can have adverse effects on outcomes of male reproductive toxicity, including sperm motility and semen volume. With PFNA, there was only one human study which looked at both uh, outcomes of male reproductive toxicity and uh, thyroid levels, thyroid outcomes. Serum samples from 857 human males were divided into age groups, and the medium PFNA levels in their serum increased with increasing age. No significant associations were found between PFNA and testosterone levels for any age group. Among the 12 to 20-year-olds, the median PFNA level uh, for that group was associated with a significant increase in thyroid-stimulating hormones. In rats, in the uh, NTP 28 drinking water study of PFNA, the lowest observed significant effect level for outcomes of male reproductive toxicity was higher than the lowest observed significant effect level for thyroid outcomes, and those were uh, both total and free T4 levels. In zebrafish, PFNA induced disruption of thyroid hormone transport, metabolism, synthesis, and function. The authors suggested that an observed increase in transthyretin transcript in zebrafish could reflect induction of transcription Due to competitive binding of PFNA, they proposed that PFNA could induce transthyretin transcription across species and yet still produce opposite effects on thyroid hormone levels in rats versus zebrafish. In other words, the same mechanism could produce different apical outcomes. In vitro, across several studies, PFNA bound to transthyretin and inhibited T4 binding. PFNA decreased proliferation of T3-dependent rat pituitary GH3 cells with, in the absence of cytotoxicity. An in silico molecular docking model found PFNA fit binding pockets of both TTR and thyroxin binding globulin. Overall, these results teased for a possible mechanistic relationship with PFNA between PFNA disruption of thyroid hormone function contributing to observed male reproductive effects. While the available data are consistent with such a relationship, it cannot uh, establish a cause and effect. And uh, turn back to Dr. Moran. Great. Thank you, Marlisa. Uh, so now, uh, a brief uh, summary of the mechanistic data for PFNA. We have the effect on HPG axis include altered hormone levels, such as reduced testosterone levels in male rat and mice, and increased serum estradiol in male rat and zebrafish. We were increased MAS, Miller and Inhibiting Substance Messenger, 
levels in rat and primary rat sertoli cells and decrease progesterone production in vitro. PFNA also induces changes in gene and protein expression of a number of enzymes and factors involved in esterogenic Heterogenesis in mice and several fish. PFNA interact with estrogen receptors in several animals and in vitro models and with the androgen receptor in vitro. Affects gene and or protein expression of some hormone receptors, such as decreased testicular androgen receptor in mice, decreased FSH receptor and LH receptor in rat, in rat primary receptor cells, and decreased brain estrogen receptor alpha and beta and androgen receptor. There also decreased gonadal FSH and LH receptor and increased liver estrogen receptor and estrogen alpha and beta in several fish. PFNA interferes with thyroid hormones, binding serum levels and function. Now, uh, Dr. Ijazaman Nickman uh, will present a summary of the key characteristics characteristic of male reproductive toxicants and endocrine disrupting chemicals for PFNA. Dr. Mikman. Good morning. Recently, a set of key characteristics that are frequently exhibited by exogenous agents that can cause male reproductive toxicity and another set that are exhibited by endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs for short have been identified by scientific experts. The key characteristics, or cases for short, can encompass many types of mechanistic endpoints and are not constrained to previously formulated hypotheses, allowing a broader consideration of multiple mechanistic pathways and hypotheses. Cases are useful as a tool to identify, organize, evaluate, and summarize relevant mechanistic data. Next, please. The eight KCs of male reproductive toxicants are shown on the left-hand side of this slide, and the 10 KCs of EDCs are shown on the right-hand side. In the HID, we discuss the available mechanistic information in relation to these two sets of KCs. Next, please. The KCs shown here in bold are those for which there is applicable information from studies of PFNA and has already been presented by previous speakers. Next, please. And now here, this table summarizes the animal and human data for PFNA. All of the studies in animals were conducted by the oral route. In rats or mice, there were reduced epididymal and testes weights. Histopathological changes were seen in the testes and epididymis, including interstitial cell atrophy, spermatid retention, germ cell degeneration, and other changes in rats, and germ cell degeneration in mice. There were reductions in epididymal sperm counts in rats and mice, as well as reductions in epididymal sperm motility and viability in mice. Serum levels of testosterone were reduced in rats and mice, and reductions in intratesticular testosterone levels were also seen in mice. Effects on the development of the male reproductive system incl included delayed prepucial separation, reduced intratesticular testosterone, steroidogenic protein, and PCNA levels, which most likely indicate an inhibition of Sertoli cell proliferation in mice following in utero exposure. In humans, a dose-dependent reduction in sperm concentration was observed in the study with the highest PFNA levels. Decreased serum testosterone levels were associated with higher PFNA concentrations in serum, plasma, or semen in studies of boys, adolescents, and younger men. This concludes our presentation on PFNA. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um for those overviews. I'd now like to um, ask the committee if anyone has any clarifying questions based on the most recent uh, presentations. So again, just you can raise your hand um, either uh, on camera or using the raise hand function. Um, let's see, sorry. 
I'm having a bit of an issue here scrolling through the there are no raised hands yeah. okay I don't see any <laughs> yeah thank you um, I also don't see any so then we can turn to the committee discussion of PF PFNA and so I'm going to now ask the um, the uh, discussants that were um, designated for each of the topic areas and we're going to start with the epidemiological studies so I'd like to ask Dr. Hertz Pizzioto to begin um, discussing the uh, epidemiological studies of PFNA. Thank you. So this is a, an interesting um, set of data. Um, I, I think the summary that was given was actually very, uh, it was really quite excellent. And, uh, you know, I will sort of briefly go through um, the studies, of, but just um, really want to uh, thank the staff for, for the work uh, that you've done in, in uh, uh, going through and summarizing all of these data. Um, I will say my overall assessment is I'm a little bit I'm underwhelmed by uh, the epidemiologic evidence uh, on PFNA. And <clears throat> um, the many of the studies have really null findings. Um, and and that's, you know, that's at you know levels. Uh, that we are seeing in the actual populations. Um, the studies are, are as a whole, um, quite a few of them did adjust for a lot of the factors that one would want to adjust for. Um, not all, however. And um, the, uh, so the anogenital distance, um, you know, uh, as pointed out, there were sort of opposite effects. Uh, although the effects that were in the increased uh, anogenital distance actually um, seemed to be more, um, uh, it seemed to be just limited to one quartile and, and I'm not sure it really, therefore really meant anything. So uh, in, in, on balance, I see the evidence being more towards uh, a decrease in anogenital distance, but again, just two studies there. Um, for the um, uh, the sperm studies, and and there were quite a few of them, uh, the, the the two that I think really stand out uh, were the the pan study, uh, which looked. Wait, is it the pan study? Sorry, hold on. Let me see if I've got this right. Um, yeah, so the PAN study saw a, a number of outcomes that were sort of similarly showing decreased motility um, and decreased velocity measured in two different uh, ways using curvilinear and straight velocity linear. Um, and it also saw increases in uh, DFI and in uh, HDS. Um, so uh, this seemed to be, and that was in the serum, um, in the semen, there was no association except for the increase in, in um, HDS. Uh, but th that at least uh, to me, it seemed to show sort of a, a bit of a coherent kind of, um, of, of set of results. Uh, and then the other one was the MA study, uh, which uh, was highlighted in, in the presentation as well. And I'm having trouble finding it on my list on the table here. It, uh, let's see. Yes, uh, which, uh, which saw um, also a reduced uh, sperm concentration. Um, and uh, uh, that was an IVF cohort. So it's a different, uh, it's a very specific population. Uh, but I think it's still valid to be looking at these findings in um, in special populations that may, for, for one reason or another, be more susceptible. Uh, so that I, th I thought that that was, uh, you know, a, a, a finding that was definitely worth paying attention to. 
Um, the other finding uh, that I found very um, impressive uh, was the DNA methylation, the epigenetic study by Leader, um, which saw changes, um, in, in fact, uh, increases in uh, a couple of the, the, in the line one, and also in the S, S, SAT alpha, um, and a decrease in the flow symmetric, uh, si flow cytometric uh, uh, assay uh, using, uh, looking at the digital global methylation assay. Um, and these were part male partners of pregnant women. So, uh, so the, it was not actually having, seemingly not having a, a clinical effect on, on fertilization, uh, but nevertheless, it, it, these were seemed like important indicators uh, to take into account. Uh, and then, you know, other studies, uh, uh, most of the studies, most of the other studies looking at um, uh, morphology uh, really uh, did not see anything. However, the Lewis study uh, saw a greater proportion with normal morphology and a lower proportion with a coiled tail. Uh, so that uh, there, there's really not much on morphologic um, outcomes in terms of uh, sperm morphology. Um, the last outcome that I think was, was notable were uh, several studies looking at uh, a PSA, uh, a prostate-specific uh, antigen. Um, and these studies actually, one of the studies uh, did find higher concentrations of PFDA actually in prostate cancer versus controls, uh, but there was actually no association that they found with PSA. Uh, another study which came up with very uh, quite null results uh, on, on PSA uh, seemed really quite flawed in that their adjustment for age was extremely crude. I mean, it was you know less than 49 and lower and 50 and above. And uh, you know they had they had a very wide age range, including it was a very large study with uh, thousands of of men, and um, they certainly could have done a much uh, much more uh, precise uh, parameterization of age. And of course, uh, age would be associated uh, with with both PSA and uh, could be associated easily. Uh, uh, with 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 the uh, with PF uh, NA because of the um, uh, time trends in different uh, perfluorinated substances, so that uh, you would tend to have um, a, a longer period of of uh, some of the other PFAs uh, for the older men. Uh, so I think it's pretty un inconclusive uh, uh, around the, the PSA. And I think that concludes uh, the outcomes that uh, were looked at epidemiologically. Um, the the horm hormone levels, uh, I think I mentioned, um, we have a little bit of data and you know it, it is striking that animal studies seem to, to well, I'm not here to summarize that, but but I do think uh, we need to, of course, look at all of the data as as um, Oiha has has reminded us on previous occasions. Uh, but I would say that overall, um, the epidemiology is is not very compelling around male reproductive uh, outcomes. Although there are some indications uh, that I I have pointed out, particularly related to some of the epigenetics and um, and some of the uh, other sperm characteristics like motility, but not enough replication of, of those findings to be to be to say something truly definitive. Thank you very much, Dr. Hurst Pizzotto. Um, next, uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Breton to um, discuss the epidemiological studies as well. Sure. Thank you. Um, I. 
I'll start by saying, you know, that I, I agree with much of what Dr. Um, Hirsch Pachota said. Um, I would <clears throat> like to reiterate that I think for the, just in summary, that I think that the outcomes of anogenital distance and can the cancer related outcomes generally have very few studies and they're um, very um, either null or quite inconclusive and in, um, uh, in general. So there's really, uh, I think in my mind, no evidence in support of those outcomes at this point in time. Um, the ones that have more data and more evidence, I think, are both uh, in the area of the hormones a little bit, and then with um, the uh, sperm function and motility. So I think that I'll start, I just had a couple of additional comments I wanted to make about a few of the studies. Um, the hormone, the, the testosterone data in, in general, I found, you know, it's very mixed from the, the, the studies that we have. Um, but one of the ones, the studies that I sort of gave a little bit more weight to was the study, um, the 2020 study by Qui. So it has a reasonable sample size of 650. And it's actually the same study population as the PAN study that looked, that was like the year before that looked at the, the sperm. So, which I'll talk about later too. And I think, um, so this study did show decreased testosterone um, in serum and also in semen. And so what I liked about these two studies, they were the only studies that looked at levels in the semen in addition to serum and saw similar results. Um, and I thought that that was fairly powerful that you're, you're looking more in the target tissue in humans and, and you're seeing some effects of the PFNA. Um, so, so I wanted to mention that. And then, um, but you know the other the other new study when it comes to hormones that I that is conflicting, of course, is the Espinosa study was which was that later study that was added, and this has a really big sample size of of more than two thousand. Um, it's you know it's a higher exposed population, but it's boys, so it's a, the age range is very different, and that you know that may play a ro role in the effects that we either do or don't see. So they did not observe any um, effects on test testosterone levels in that population, um, although they did for PFOA. So, you know, it looked at other, other PFOS, but um, for specifically PFNA, there, were no, there was no evidence for an association. So again, I'm left, you know, the, the data on the testosterone is pretty mixed. And by itself, I, I would have a hard time saying there's real conclusive evidence, um, but I think in parallel with other evidence in, in vitro and animal models, you know, that we can discuss down the line, you know, that also, paints a bigger picture. So I think of all the outcomes, actually the sperm function and motility uh, studies probably have the greatest level of support from the epi literature. And, um, and Irva mentioned the two studies, that, like the MOS study, as well as the PAN study, which I think, um, again, I was, um, I really liked, liked those two because there's a lot of things that are different about them, but they are showing some consistency in results. And again, the PAN study, because they had both semen and serum levels that showed consistency uh, and a, a strong um, sample size, I thought that was good. The caveat there was that it's a mixture of men who are infertile and not uh, infertile and infertile. And so I thought, you know, um, you know, sort of it's a mixed bag, but with the MOS study, it's, it's an IVF population. And it's, um, they were all couples who were coming to the clinic because there was female infertility. So not male infertility um, by my read of the paper. And so that I thought was a good separate population um, of fertile men. And you're seeing the same result, even though the sample size was a lot smaller. So those were the two, I think I wanted to point out with, with regard to, to sperm function. Um, and I guess my summary is that of all, um, Sort of of all the epi literature to date, we probably have some evidence for reduction in sperm quality taken as a whole, um, particularly when you look at the parallels in semen and plasma or serums, and um, that they. But it's really a mixed bag on testosterone and and the other outcomes are really ha have been very few studies, and most of them have e either been null or mixed results. And I think that's about all I have. Thank you very much, Dr. Breton. Um, now we're going to um, move on to the animal studies. So I'd like to ask Dr. Ayun Kim to discuss the animal studies. Hi, everybody. 
Uh, yeah, I wanted to echo um, the sentiments of um, of uh, of others that the OHEA staff really did a really good job of, of summarizing the animal study data. I think it was very helpful to look at the, the data in a chart-like manner rather than just discuss it. Um, it uh, definitely, it was good to break down um, the effects that were seen in the papers. Um, so the NTP studies, uh, th there was an NTP study where ma uh, male rats were treated with um, treated with uh, PFNA um, for 28 days. And so a full sperm cycle in rat is generally about, you know, 50, it's, it's about 56 days. And so a full histologic, histopathology was conducted in these studies, um, but it was associated at the higher doses in the study with deaths and um, at the higher doses, meaning five and 10 mg per kg, um, as well as, um, uh, some liver and immunotoxicology effects. So, so essentially because the testes is presumed to be a target tissue for PD, PFDA, um, it was evaluated further in this, in this uh, it was evaluated as a target tissue for this in this study. Um, and so, you know, as mentioned in the, as mentioned in the, um, the summary um, previously, um, you did see some um, decreases in testes and epididymal weight at about 1.25 and uh, lower testosterone levels compared to controls and then some effects on um, the um, histologically on the epididymis and, and, um, and testes. So, um, and so this, in this study, I guess one of the issues I had was that it was, we only about, it was only evaluated the histo time points at, um, were evaluated at only one time point, and that was um, not a full sperm cycle. And so, um, you know, it's likely that that it, with continued dosing, that it would we would continue to see the same effects. Um, and whether there would be recovery if there is no dosing, um, that was not able to be determined in the study. Um, another study, Fang et al. Um, looked at the ultra structural effects of PFNA. On, on male reproductive organs and found that um, there is uh, altered structure of the Sertoli cells. Um, and in this study, the animals were dosed for only 14 days um, at one, three, and five mix per kg. Um, and so ultra structurally, there were, um, there were uh, impacts on the Sertoli cells and um, sperm. Uh, and essentially, you know, demonstrated that PFNA treatment for these 14 days can lead to the damage of um, specific secretory functions of the Sertoli cells. And um, let's see, then two additional rat studies were investigated on hormones. Um, and this is on the Hadra paper as well as FANG and um, essentially showed that uh, the plasma concentrations of, um, of testosterone were um, was, were decreased. Let's see. And then, and then, and then we move on to like the mice studies, um, where essentially in these studies we looked at, or DOS looked at, um, PFNA, um, in pregnant mice. Um, and so your, the study looked at the development effects of the male pups, um, and so it's not direct male reproductive, not of the direct effect on male reproductive toxicity. And then the other mice studies um, um, conducted by the Singh lab um, treated um, pre 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 and so they looked at the spermatogenesis, sterogenesis, and fertility, um, uh, and the effect of gestational exposure and the development of neo neonatal mice testes. Um, and essentially did see some effects at the, the higher dose levels. Um, in one of the studies, male fertility was looked at and um, where, Unexposed females were were uh, mated with exposed males, um, and at the 0.5 mg per kg dose, uh, only five of the seven unexposed females were 
uh, impregnated, whereas at the lower dose levels and the control, all the females became pregnant. And so whether this is part of variability um, is unknown. And, um, and then there was also the zebrafish where um, essentially the, the zebrafish were exposed to different levels of PFNA for 180 days um, and led to a decrease in male um, GSI index and um, increases in both. And, and unlike in the um, rodent studies, it saw increases in testosterone levels in those studies. So while the studies on their own do indicate that PF, PF, um, PF um, NA can, um, can be a male reproductive toxicant and impairs the spermatogenic process, I think we need to look at the studies carefully. Each study has some deficiencies that make it difficult to vote, to indicate that it's a clear reproductive toxicant um, based on what information was provided. Um, the, the main issue I have is that the reproductive effects are observed at extremely high doses that are um, essentially thousands fold higher than what is seen in um, California residents. Um, I think it was Dr. Pessa that asked earlier about the serum concentrations. And so both the NTP studies and the Hadra paper both looked at serum concentrations. Um, so in the NTP studies, toxicity was observed at 1.25 mg per cake per day, which had a plasma concentration of approximately 161,000 um, nanograms per mil. Um, in the HADRUP study, um, the plasma concentration in rats administered the lowest dose, which was 0 0.0125 mg per cake per day, was 396 nanograms per um, milliliter. And so this is in the range of the same, um, same exposure. Um, when taking into effect what the dose is. Um, and then in the HID that was sent to us, um, the, the range of PFNA that is observed in California residents um, range from 0 .20 or 0 0.205 in the California uh, nanograms per milliliter in the California Regional Exposure Study and to, uh, that was published in 2019. And then and then the high end was 1.15 nanograms per mil in the Firefighter Occupational Exposures Project. And that was a 2010-ish study. Um, oh. So I saw, see, um, oh, okay. Uh, I see uh, uh, Dr. Woodruff's comment on um, not supposed to make Yeah, I'll just say it. I just thought yeah. maybe Carol can weigh in. I thought we weren't supposed to consider dose uh, exposure levels when we're making our evaluation of the hazard. Is that right, Carol? Can you clarify? Um, yeah, generally that's true. You, you shouldn't um, consider the current dose um, that, that a person might be receiving, but I think you can certainly look at the doses in the studies. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. right. So essentially, based on my calculations, we're looking at doses that are approximately 150,000 fold higher than um, what may be observed um, in, in humans in California. Um, additionally, I think that there's very limited number of studies um, that did not have an overlap in the male reproductive evaluation. You had the NTP studies. Um, that was a repeat dose that looked at histologically and, and sperm um, parameters, but then and then in the, the remaining studies were um, were my studies that looked at more development exposure in um, in uh, younger younger mice, um, and then the reproductive performance uh, details are limited in the one study in conducted in the mice and the um, zebrafish studies, both males and females were treated. Um, and so, and then lastly, the doses that um, effects were seen were also associated with other um, significant toxicity, um, such as decreased food consumption, body weight loss, and overt liver toxicity or immunotoxicology in the animal models that were tested. Um, as such, I do not believe that the animal studies reviewed clearly indicates that PFNA as a male reproductive toxicant, um, I think that 
you know, there are some uh, further evaluation, well, uh, uh, further evaluation would be helpful um, to see, uh, to determine um, whether it's a reproductive toxic, male reproductive toxicant. Thank you very much, Dr. Ayan Kim. Um, Dr. Uh, Woodruff, would you like to discuss the animal studies next? Um, yes, sure. Thank you very much. And thank you for that summary. And thank you to the staff for the summary. I want to start off by saying that um, I looked at the animal studies and I, before I give my comments, I want to note that um, in terms of the sensitivity of animal studies in order to see an observational health effect, and I'm talking about an apical endpoint, and I hope uh, that there's been a lot of good literature, including reviews by the National Academy of Sciences that find that while we have good concordance between animal and human studies, humans are often much more sensitive in terms of their response, their dose response than animal studies. And there's a lot of good reasons why animals are not a very sensitive model for human health effects, including the, um, some of it has to do with um, the exposures that occur. Do they do the exposures during sensitive time periods of development? Um, also, I, uh, Dr. hertz picciotto raised the issue about cumulative exposures. Animals are individually dosed and it doesn't really, does not reflect the fact that there are multiple exposures occurring, so you would not expect a response um, at a similar level in humans. And then I also wanna comment on the statistical approaches that these studies often use. They typically compare individual doses to the control and don't look at the dose response. So while it's true that you may see a more, quote, statistically significant responses at higher levels, there's often a dose response curve. And I'm gonna talk about, um, and those, and so not all the data are modeled in this. And thus you can observe trends in the data. Um, it may not be, but that is not necessarily statistically analyzed in studies, though that would be observed if they had done that. But it does limit the statistical power if they only are looking one dose at a time. And um, let me see. All the studies that, uh, as we noted, there are six animal studies. Um, the OEHA staff reviewed all the studies. Um, also, I wanna note that there's also can be strain and species differences in sensitivity. So some species are more responsive to exposures. Mice tend to be uh, more sensitive to exposures than rats, for example. Um, in the studies, animal studies of PFNA, we saw exposures on rats, mice, and one in zebrafish. And they tended to evaluate more apical outcomes. So um, as was noted by the presentation, testicular weight, preprovertial separation, epidemal weight, sperm parameters, heads, viability, number, and testosterone. Um, but I really was, I thought we had uh, a lot of good information on exposures to PFNA in animals and responses in the biological mechanisms that are related to either uh, male reproductive health or developmental male reproductive health effects. So I thought that made the uh, information much more powerful. Um, I wanna note that while there are six mammalian studies, four of them were published by the same authors, Singh and Singh, and they were all published in 2019. Um, I also uh, went through the studies individually and evaluated the study quality because um, and this is where I feel it would be helpful from the OEHO staff to look at what's been going on at EPA in terms of giving us better information about the parameters, the methodological parameters that can contribute to um, internal validity in the studies. And so I um, want to note that pretty much the studies, so the NTP study, the DAS study, the Singh laboratory studies, and the, looking down here, the Zhang study, which is in zebrafish, and the Fang study, which is male. I'm gonna leave that one out because they didn't report about whether they randomized or not, but the NTP, the DAS, the Singh studies, and the Zhang studies 
all um, uh, reported uh, purity of the substance. They had high purity of the, of the substance for exposure. They all randomized um, their study the, uh, in the experimental design. Uh, was not reported whether they did blinding of exposures and outcomes, so that makes the study a little more difficult to interpret. They did have complete outcome data and selective reporting, and um, they didn't identify any other biases in the studies. Um, I want to note that, uh, that I looked at the studies a little bit differently because there were um, two of the studies that were focused on prenatal exposures. And I think this is really important when we're thinking about comparing it to the human epidemiological evidence, because we would expect that the prenatal period could, will be a more sensitive period for exposures to any particular chemical. And we can look at PFNA in this case, um, because it could affect male reproductive development. And as you see, there's been a lot of studies that have evaluated the relationship between exposure and different biological method mechanisms that can contribute to male reproductive uh, health effects. So the prenatal exposure studies were the DAS 2015 study and the SING 2019 study. I think what was um, nice about these two studies was that we saw, actually they're both in, in mice, one in CD1 mice and the other in male parts mice. Um, and they looked at different aspects of male reproductive development. Their gavage doses were in the similar range as was actually all the studies that were conducted um, these animal studies for PFNA. And the uh, DAS study evaluated the prebiotic separation in males, and the SING study looked at testes, testosterone, and testes weight. And I know that there was a question earlier about testes, testosterone, and I wanted to just say that that has been evaluated as a relevant um, male reproductive health effect, and I would refer that question to the National Academy of Sciences report on their systematic review of prenatal phthalate exposure and male reproductive health effects, um, which also looked at testosterone in fetal testes. So um, I want to note that in the DAS study that there was no statistically significant effects in maternal body weight, indicating that there's no effect of treatment on the mother, but they did see a difference in dose dependent manner on pre prebiotic separation. What I really liked about this study is that they modeled the dose response and they calculated a benchmark dose at the 5% response level. Um, and the benchmark dose at the lower end was 1.3 milligrams per kilogram day. Now, I just wanna note that this is a good example of where all the data were used to analyze the dose response and that they saw a response that's um, pretty much at the kind of, I would say, looking at across these dose response, more at the lower end of the um, dose response across all the different animal studies. I did also want to note that um, when you do the benchmark dose analysis, that allows, because you're using all the data in the dose response, it allows a more sensitive evaluation of um, of the statistical, of, of the response level in animals. And so if you just analyze one dose at a time, it would be hard to see a 5% response, but because they're using all the data, they're able to see this 5% this response, which is at a relatively, which is at the bottom end of the dose response range. And if you look at the um, graph in the paper itself, you can see that there's a dose response in the pre separation but that if you just compared one dose at a time, you would not see this 5% response. So I feel like this makes this data very compelling. Um, and I just noted already what the methodological features on this study are. And then, so the other study that looked at prenatal exposures and response is the SING study. And they also, looked at, um, let me see, I'm just sorry. I have a lot of different files open here. Um, and the SING study looked at testes, testosterone, and testes weight. Um, they evaluated during uh, gestational exposures and then looked at postnatal day three. And they also saw um, effects on testosterone and a trend in declining uh, testes weight. 
and I think in this one there was uh, this one. Yeah, so just, that's so I just those are the two prenatal exposure studies, and then the rest of the studies as um, as Dr. Ian Kim noted were done in uh, adulthood, though not during the full cycling of sperm. Um, this is the NTP study, the SING study to 2019, and sorry, I lost on my pages. Um, and then the um, the Zhang study, which is in, in zebrafish. And I want to just briefly mention the sperm quality because this also is in relationship to the, the epidemiology studies. So um, the NTP study, the SING 2018, um, looked at uh, sperm motility, viability, and number. Um, the NTP study looked at epidemial sperm count. And I want to note that in the SING 2019 study, that the body weight, there was no effects on body weight um, of the animals at the different exposure levels, but there were effects on sperm fertility and proteins linked to sperm production. So I thought that was important to note. Um, there also was a dose response relationship between um, the exposures and the proteins and enzymes involved in testosterone biosynthesis, including the star protein, and the, um, the SF1 and the histological, which I'm not an expert in histology, but that was presented uh, by, the, by the study staff. I just wanna talk a little bit about this NTP study because um, the other endpoint that was evaluated in the animal studies that was more easy to co easily compare across the studies was testicular effects. So testes weight, relative testes weight, and then gonadosomatic index, which is the gonad mass as a proportion of total body mass index. And I thought um, this was very important because as Dr. Uh, Kim mentioned that there can be some changes in body weight across the uh, exposure groups. So it's important to look at the, so what I did was looked at the testes or the epidemial weights as a proportion of the body weight. Um, so in the NTP study, it, there was, I'm just looking at this here, uh, a change that's across the body weights, but when you look at the, and to be fair, I didn't have all the data for this, but just roughly looking at the testes to body weight proportion, you see a kind of a dose response decline, which you did also see for the ratio of the epidemial weight to the body weight. So I thought that was an important indicator. And finally, this upset effect was also observed in the zebra fish. So, uh, I'm not going to, I, I, I want to also mention that eat, uh, many of these studies also looked at, I think someone else is going to talk about this, exposures as it relates to the various biological mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And um, so I thought that the, I think that one reason that it's, um, to me, this study with data was very compelling if you consider the fact that the studies are reasonably high quality and that if you look at the, when they evaluate the dose response that you do see these, these dose response effects and the fact that you see a relationship to these upstream biological indicators, including the proteins and enzymes that are um, part of testosterone synthesis. And I just wanna comment briefly on the epidemiological evidence because um, it was uh, not as robust as we would in general uh, maybe look for if we were in the area of, uh, in certain areas. But I just also want to say that um, reemphasize the point about the sensitivity of the epidemiological evidence to observe these uh, types of effects. Uh, the exposures are less and they can be less sensitive due to that. And so you would need uh, a lot of people to see an effect. And so it's sometimes really good to have heterogeneity in findings because more studies that are more sensitive and able to pick up um, effects that we wouldn't see in the, across the general population. And so that could include also um, um, study populations that are uh, having infertility issues because they may be more uh, sensitive to effects of, or more responsive to effects of, of these chemicals like PFNA, and then also um, developmental exposures. And just wanted to comment 
on the on the when we say no findings, I think what sometimes we're we need to um, distinguish between what's a statistically significant, what we have marked as a statistically significant association and an effect level where the confidence bound includes one. And I did note in these epidemiology studies on um, the, like this uh, um, Lopez Espinosa study that there was a relationship with um, some of these markers like, well, testosterone and IGF, sometimes the um, confidence limit crossed the zero mark, but I think along with the animal study that gives us a good constellation of evidence for um, PFNA. So I'm done. Thank you very much, Dr. Woodruff. I'm going to now turn to the, the mechanistic studies and ask Dr. Allard to begin the discussion of those studies. Dr. Allard? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me well? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Um, yeah, so a host of mechanisms were mentioned in the uh, hazard identification document. Um, personally, I would not actually call them mechanisms as much as molecular endpoints. And so what I really try to do is sort of weave the, um, the the animal studies, the outcome from the animal studies, and and some of the uh, sort of molecular information that we have, and really try to get at biological plausibility. So I did take into account doses for some of the stuff that we'll mention, but just in the sense of uh, trying to see what is realistic to expect um, in terms of of mechanistic effect and and how that could indeed be happening in uh, in whole animal studies. So, you know, looking at the uh, the levels mentioned uh, that are found in 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 human serum, for example, uh, we're talking about uh, levels within the nanomolar range. So, again, this is not necessarily a decision point uh, because we are on the uh, hazard identification side of things, but this is more as a way to sort of guide the molecular analysis that I that I performed. So, my my reading of the my starting point was really reading through the animal studies. And the human studies, of course, and and what, what sort of emerged from, again from my perspective was really an effect on on testosterone production. Um, um, there's some conflicting data, but the, in in my mind, the weight of evidence led uh, was in the direction of a decrease in testosterone production, and this was supported by the NTP 2019 and the Sing and Sing 2019A and B, um, um, and again. You know, the human studies, there, there was a little bit more inconsistency, but um, I thought that overall um, the, the, the data there was, was perhaps more compelling. Um, and this is supported at the molecular level by uh, several um, uh, molecular outcomes that were mentioned. Uh, so there's a decrease in production of STAR, of TSPO, of uh, CYP11A, of CYP17, and 17-beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. HSD that are all well known to be involved in the, the steroids. I'm going to stumble on that word <laughs> in the production of steroids um, and steroid hormones. So, so there's an alignment of you know the the, uh, the decrease in outcome with the enzymes that are necessary uh, for the production, including. Uh, so, what's interesting about STAR, for example, is that it's very early in the uh, steroidogenesis pathway, and so you know you, you would expect a pretty uh, um, um, pretty profound effect on on steroid hormone production. Um, so now this is not necessarily getting to a a molecular initiating event. I, th I think that was the part that was a little bit frustrating about re reviewing uh, actually both chemicals is that we don't really know biochemically how uh, PFNA could be causing a lot of these things, um, and perhaps this is you know. Um, often happening in toxicological studies. So uh, for this, I actually turn to, uh, as I usually do in those meetings, I turn to the ToxCast data and really try to parse out um, out of the plethora of different sort of um, molecular tests and assays that we run on PFNA, uh, which ones r really sort of seem to rise to the top and, and could be explaining um, these, these um, uh, molecular events, such as decreasing testosterone production. Um, and really the one that's happening at the lowest level 
uh, that was tested in the nanomolar range is an effect on the phanozoid X receptor, FXR, um, which is known to respond to biolysis, but there's an increased connection between biolysis and, um, and uh, steroid hormone production. Uh, and this was beautifully reviewed in a paper uh, uh, published by Garcia et al. in 2019. Um, and through uh, molecular analysis with um, um, uh, knockouts, we actually know that actually both elevated levels of uh, FXR, but in the kit, in the knockout, uh, you know, elevation of FXR, we know that this has a dramatic impact on sperm production and on, on sperm quality as well. Um, so, so it seems that uh, um, PFNA acts as an antagonist of FXR, so it would align with what we know from the from the knockout, and that it's AC50 is actually relatively low and within the human range of uh, 41 nanomolar. So I thought that this was to me sort of encouraging in terms of potential molecular uh, initiating events, and it's also. Important to note that, as was no noted in the hazard identification document, that um, uh, PFNA also seemed to bind the estrogen receptor, um, at least alpha, uh, although at higher level that it binds the FXR receptor, uh, but still within the na nanomolar range. So we're, we're in the high nanomolar, we are about 700 nanomolar for the AC50 for the estrogen receptor alpha. But you know, this is something that is a lot more different than any other receptors that uh, PFNS seem to bind at a much higher um, level than that. So for me, these, these um, things are potential, of course, molecular initiating events, but at least there's biological plausibility um, behind the effect um, uh, mentioned uh, and detected in several studies on testosterone. Um, the, the thyroid, um, hormone mechanism was to me less convincing and um, honestly after reading through it I decided to not necessarily investigate that that much further because I, again I did not think that this was um, very convincing um, but I do want to sort of wrap up my, my rather brief comments by saying that um, I did find the tables 441 and 442 so the key characteristics tables uh, on on uh, male reproductive toxicants and on uh, endocrine disruption to be extremely helpful um, um, in in sort of you know having a, a, a good platform to then decide um, are we really talking about an endocrine disruptor are we really talking about a, a male reproductive toxicant and I think the it, it doesn't necessarily resolve all the ambiguity because you don't have to necessarily hit every single one of the key characteristics to be a, a reproductive toxicants, but what does it mean if you hit only one out of all the many ones that were mentioned, or two, or three, or four? How you know where where do you land uh, at the end, at least in your mind, in what is a, a reprotoxicant or a, a uh, an endocrine disruptor? Nonetheless, using this table and looking at the molecular endpoints that support. Um, so some of the, the these key characteristics, I, I ended up uh, leaning towards um, uh, PFNA, uh, indeed having the, the biological mechanisms and the biological possibility to, to indeed be a male reproductive And I'll end here for my comments. Thank you very much, Dr. Allard. And we'll then turn to Dr. Pessa to continue discussing the mechanistic studies. Dr. Pessa. Thank you. Um, I took a rather different approach. Uh, I, I thought about biological plausibility with regard to the face validity of in vitro and in vivo studies, in particular the animal studies. And I appreciate uh, Dr. Brenton's comment that given the variability and oftentimes contradictory results from epidemiological studies that the animal studies really do need to have, uh, if, if you are to interpret them as either uh, uh, supportive or not supportive of plausibility, uh, that they need to have face validity and productive, uh, predictive value. I just want to point out that um, if you do a calculation on the highest blood levels in uh, the studies that have been done, uh, serum levels, um, and I always think of concentrations, if you want to look at mechanisms, as molar concentrations. So I converted uh, 
the uh, nanograms per liter, uh, the geometric means uh, in the firefighters to a molar concentration. And uh, they are uh, relatively low, uh, about uh, 1.5 to 2 femtomolar. That's uh, 10 to the minus 12. Now, if we go to the NTP study, where, um, uh, and in fact, I thank Dr. Lee for pointing out the table, table 20. Um, they actually do a good job of converting the uh, milligrams per kilogram per day dosing to a molar concentration in plasma. And if you'll see at two and a half migs per kg per day, you're saturating the pharmacokinetics of uh, PFNA. In other words, you're up around 800 uh, micromolar plasma levels at two and a half mg per kg per day, and you double that dose and you're pretty much saturated. Um, you have to realize that many of the results that have been presented here from animal studies, whether they be um, the uh, uh, sperm or blood uh, outcomes, uh, require doses uh, certainly of two and a half or above mix per kg per day. There is a relationship that the longer the exposure is, uh, there's a slight shift to the lower uh, concentrations for the uh, low L or the, or the minimal, no, sorry, no L. So what does this mean? It means that all the animal and most of the in vitro studies, which were done in mid micromolar to high micromolar, in many cases up as high as three to 500 micromolar, are orders of magnitude, six orders of magnitude uh, higher than those observed in the highest exposed population. What does that mean mechanistically? Many of the targets that have been looked at, and uh, Dr. Allard really did a great job at pinpointing two endpoints, two targets that seem to be influenced by nanomolar PNF, uh, PNFA. Uh, and, and those may be um, sort of the benchmark uh, sort of uh, points of departure where you can say, well, here we're getting very close uh, or at least closer, but you still have to realize we're at least three orders to four orders of magnitude of Above, higher than what you find in the highest exposed population. What does that mean in terms of receptor occupancy? Well, for the FXR and the ER receptors, uh, these receptors, uh, their ligands are in the sub-nanomolar. And so if you're talking about 10 nanomolar PNFA, uh, which is again, uh, two to four orders of magnitude higher than what you find, there is no possibility that they can interact with those targets given the difference in their affinity, uh, even over long periods of time as these receptors are signaling with their endogenous molecule. So I found that the animal studies and the biochemical studies um, at the very start lack face validity because there's no uncertainty factor that you can put in that would give you six log units. So with that, I also looked at the quality of some of these studies, in particular Sing and Sing, and I found that there was no control um, for a bias. In other words, there was no blinding um, for the histological evaluations. The histological evaluations were not quantitative, rather qualitative, uh, although they did have some strengths and those strengths were pointed out in terms of sampling and sample design. Um, I also want to point out that many of the outcomes in Sing and Sing and, for example, Feng and Al, they did not actually show dose-response relationship. They either showed a threshold effect where the lowest concentration had a maximal effect and the higher concentrations maintain that effect, so they didn't have a no effect. Uh, and if they did, it, it was also reduced, it wasn't zero. 
Uh, and in some of the outcomes, it was um, non-monotonic. In other words, the low concentrations produced a statistically significant effect, but as you escalated the dose, it actually disappeared. And I sort of wonder um, why that might be. There was no real rationale or explanation for that. Uh, and the zebrafish tend to be more sensitive, but when you're working with such high concentrations, if you think about zebrafish in a pool of water, there's only one place that those uh, aqueous doses, if in fact they are soluble, because there's some uncertainty whether the solubility in water can even be attained at the concentrations used, uh, that they would accumulate in the zebrafish over the 90 days. So um, it would have been really reassuring if they had measured the internal doses in the zebrafish uh, and, and gave a bioaccumulation factor for their experiments. So with that, um, I'm going to stop. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pessa. Um, we now have time for a little bit of committee discussion. I know that we're scheduled to have a lunch break at 12, so I wanted to ask staff if, um, can we go a little bit longer with the discussion now, or do we want to hold it to five minutes and then break for lunch? No, you can break for lunch when you find a good breaking point. That's okay, fine. wonderful. Thank you. So then I, we're going to open up the um, to full committee discussion. So um, please let, uh, again, use the rate hand raising option to um, indicate that you wish to speak and see if any other committee members have comments about these um, studies, epidemiological, animal, or um, mechanistic studies. Uh, let's see, uh, Dr. Breton. Hi, I, I just had a question actually about um, what you sort of just alluded to, um, which was that there might, that there weren't dose response associations shown in some of the animal models, but I, I, I guess I had been given the impression that from the summary slide and also from Dr. Woodruff's that, that there were evidence, that there was evidence of dose response in some of the animal studies. So I was just wondering if we might discuss that a little bit more. Sure. I must have missed something, but I did go to Sing and Sing and Fang et al. And if you look at some of those measures, uh, they really aren't uh, dose response. They, they just, you, you have an effect at the lowest level and those effects are maintained as you escalate the dose. And then in some measures, they disappear at the higher levels. And so they don't really account for that very unexpected concentration effect or dose effect relationship. I know that some persistent organic pollutants do show a non-monotonic, but they always show a no effect level that's more of a U-shaped dose response. Here, I, I don't think that some of these measures had a U-shaped dose response. Yeah, I just want to comment on this. I made this comment about the DOS study. So the DOS study, and again, it's a little bit influenced. It's somewhat influenced about the, how they analyze the data, right? In epidemiological study, they take all the data and then they create a beta estimate with all the data. That's not how a lot of these animal studies are evaluated. They look at each dose and then they compare it to the control. So it's a little bit like uh, a quartile, you know, a quartile analysis or something like that. So the DOS study is a good example where you saw this prenatal exposure and, just, and then and the prebirthal separation that you can see in the graph is increasing. And when they analyzed all the um, data together, they did a benchmark dose model. And what that is, is they analyze the data, they uh, create a dose response, and then they look at the exposure level that relates to a certain percent in decrement. So for example, in this case, they look at a 5% decrement in the, um, just the, the, the length, the, this time to separation. So what that means is that 
often when you're looking at the animal studies, there's a lot of reasons that they appear let they may not, it, it, it could be that there's less sensitive measures of the relationship and therefore you don't see a response. So I just wanna address this Noel issue because this has come up a lot in the toxicological literature that respond, that means the no observed effect level. And we've done an analysis of the data, the dose response data from animal studies and comparing it to the no observed effect level. The no observed effect level is highly driven by methodological design because they basically take the control and then each of the exposures and then they say, oh, well, this one's not statistically significant, but there could still be an elevated effect that must be a no observed effect level. That does not mean there's not an effect at that exposure. An analysis we did of benchmark doses that EPA used for reference doses found that the no AL, which is typically in the range of one to 10% response, and it's because it's very difficult given that there's not very many animals per dose to, to see responses in that lower end of the dose response range. So I think we have to analyze, this is why I feel like it would be super helpful if OEHA would take the data from the animal studies and put it into HOC so we could look at the dose response levels together. It's quite, it's quite standardized now within that process. And I think that would help us see, like you can in these epi studies like this Lopez, this Lopez study, you can see quite well what's going on at the different dose levels and the responses. So that's what I wanted to say about that. Do we have any other comments from other panel members? But Dr. Woodruff, I think you mentioned a benchmark dose of 1.3 mg per kg per day as one. Uh, yeah, in this, yeah, that's right. And, and that would correspond to about a 350 micromolar plasma level. Okay, but we're not supposed to consider what the exposures are in the human in the California population when deciding the no, hazard, no, I, right? I understand that, but I, I think 350 micromolar to observe a benchmark dose in an animal study is unrealistic and probably does not have face validity, which weakens its usefulness for prediction. I, I guess I don't quite face validity. I just want to just also, I mean, the levels at which we're seeing reference doses now being set for these perfluorinated chemicals are quite low. So I know Huiha set for PFOA set an acceptable daily dose of, what am I, I did this because I was interested in this, um, it was like 0.45 nanograms per kilogram day. You know, EPA just came out with a, a reference dose for PFOA based on a systematic review of the PFO evidence, that's 1.5 times 10 to the minus nine milligrams per kilogram day. I mean, that's, you know, basically they're saying that there is levels very, very low at which we're seeing potential health effects from these exposures. So I, I guess I'm not, and that's based on animal studies and human studies that are at higher levels. Also the human studies, are at relevant exposure levels. So I think we have to look at the human data in conjunction with the animal data, in conjunction with the mechanistic data. So that's what I feel is important. Yeah, and I think a, another thing that I wanted to again add too, which I think several of the panelists brought up was that the, there, the dosing intervals were relatively short in these studies, but there did appear to potentially that it looked as though with longer dosing there, that there was a tendency maybe for more uh, greater effect, obviously right. that's with different studies. Right. Um, and obviously in humans, I mean, these are very persistent um, chemical. Uh, this is within the body. It has a long half-life and measured in, I think it was uh, years we heard. <laughs> um, so that, you know, we see bioaccumulation with these chemicals. So I think that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, do we have any other comments or questions? Or is maybe everyone? I see two hands up. 
Dr. Bertin, okay, Dr. Allard. Uh, yes, okay. Thank you. I had to circle back through the other page. Um, Dr. Allard. Yeah, um, I, I just redid my calculations just to be extra clear. And we're spending a lot of time talking about those when perhaps we shouldn't be. But um, I, I did sort of land on um, the, the human serum levels corresponding to the nanomolar range, which to me is interesting to consider thinking that the in vitro endpoints that were measured uh, are also performed at the nanomolar range. So again, going back to the question of biological possibility uh, and thinking that there could be an overlap. But I, I did hear what Dr. Pissas said in terms of the endogenous ligands being able to bind at, at much lower levels. So that's something to consider, but at least we are talking about something where the human doses and the, some of the in vitro points were generated using, th there's overlap, that's the bottom line. Can I ask you a question about that? If you have, multiple chemicals though in this low range all competing say in this case for the receptor wouldn't that then mean that you would have the, the effect of pfna could be happening you know at even it's a low level but because there's other chemicals that we're all exposed to that could influence the, the sensitivity i think it's possible but we Right. We, there's no competitive assays that were performed. And so we're, we're sort of getting further and further away from, you know, it's, it's basically. No, not here, but getting, in other, you know. other examples for another chemical and another receptor for, binding. For PCBs, it's been demonstrated right. that there's additivity uh, and sometimes more than additivity. So yes, but that, I don't think that was in our data set, you know, to consider others. And, and that goes back to Irva's point that exposures are more complex than just PMFA, PFNA, so. Dr. Breton? Uh, I just wanted to say one other thing that um, Trace, uh, that Dr. Woodruff brought, brought up, which was um, that I forgot to mention when I was summarizing the epi study, which is that, especially I think for the testosterone results, several of the studies that showed no association did in fact have non-significant trends in that direction. So um, coupled with the fact that generally the sample sizes are low and the PFAS levels or the PFNA levels are often on the lower end, um, or don't have a great dynamic range that we probably are butting up against statistical power issues for some of the studies. I didn't do a post hoc power analysis for any of them, so I can't tell you, with, you know, with certainty. But I would say I would I'd be willing to bet that at least for some of them, that's also you know it's unfortunate and that's but it's playing a role. And, and some of the studies that showed effects, some some of the I think some of the studies um, that were from. China and Taiwan tended to have some of the higher PMF, PFNA levels too. So I think that's sort of also sort of supporting this notion of this confluence of, you know, how high are the levels, what's the dynamic range of the levels, and what's your sample size. And, and you know, so, so some of the non-significant trends I do, do think um, lend some support. Um, obviously, it partly depends on where you sit on your interpretation of statistical significance a little bit. Um, but I just wanted to mention that. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Horst Pizzioto. Yeah. Um, I, again, I, I'm. Um, I, I think that the the context of these exposures is is really important, um, and the. You know, I started out thinking, oh, the mechanistic data was really strong, um, and that that makes up for kind of the the, you know, particularly some of the in vitro uh, studies in, in particular seem very overwhelmingly, you know, there's, there's something going on here. And of course, I was thinking, well, I don't know how these, these doses are. And Dr. Faiser really did a great job of, of pointing out that they are really um, at uh, astronomically high levels in, in, in some cases. And, uh, and then, you know, the animal studies, um, yeah, I, 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 I feel like we, when you put it all together, there's this feeling that there is something there. The epi has not been the strong enough studies um, or the large enough studies or the, the, the sensitive enough populations to necessarily pick it all up. Uh, but if we're only talking not about risk assessment here, but about hazard identification, uh, do, do, does PFNA, pose a hazard. And that means that at some level, 
um, it could be causing male reproductive toxicity. And, and so I feel like that's the question to ask. And I also want to just point out that the issue of interactions, okay, I understand that the, the way when Proposition 65 was passed, it was all about one by one chemicals. Um, but we, we, we are at a phase in, I mean, and even OEHA has a lot of um, effort now on cumulative risk. And I think that we, there are many situations where um, a fairly low exposure that itself, all by itself, would be unlikely to cause the outcomes that you're interested in in combination with other similar uh, kinds of chemicals or chemicals that may act on a different juncture in some sort of a, uh, a progression of steps that leads to the final clinically observable outcome um, can, can often be, the effect can be amplified many fold um, by uh, the context in which these exposures may occur. And, uh, and, I, and I'm saying that not just, I mean, I started out earlier in the day talking about, well, other PFAs, uh, but I'm thinking about other rep male reproductive toxins <laughs> in, that are out in the environment as well um, that may operate through, through similar mechanisms, through other junctures on the same mechanistic pathway uh, and so forth. Um, and that, that this, this situation that we live in where, where the number of chemicals is, is in you know, the uh, tens of thousands, uh, on a daily basis, and that some of those uh, are male reproductive toxins that maybe have shown more compelling data. Um, I, I find it hard not to not to take that that mindset uh, as we evaluate um, PFNA uh, as an individual added compound in this mix. Um, it it does not seem to be benign. That that's that that seems to me to be clear, but the definitiveness and, and how strong an impact in real life situations is what does seem to be at question. Um, so I, I think that's, I, I think that's still fair enough and within, <laughs> within our role here as, um, as members of this panel uh, to, to, to put that in, in that context in place. And if I'm totally wrong and it is off base for a hazard identification, Okay. <laughs> um, can I just yes, really Dr. Quick? Yeah, Carol Monahan Cummings. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, uh, Prop 65 is unique and perhaps odd in the, in the way that it addresses these kinds of exposures because it really does look like a look at a single exposure to a single chemical and does it look at cumulative effects. And so I, I totally understand the scientific context you're talking about, but I don't think that you can um, consider that directly and say, you know, since everybody is exposed to lots of these chemicals, adding this one in could cause an effect. So I think you really need to look at this individual chemical and its, its exposures and effects to the extent you can based on the evidence you have. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, any other comments? I think that given that the dose, um, the, that there are clear evidence of dose response for some of these endpoints, both you know, testosterone and some of the other male reproductive endpoints, um, as Dr. Woodruff and others have noted, that and that we are to focus on evidence of effects on reproductive, male reproductive endpoints, um, not necessarily taking into consideration the, the, the human concentrations. Um, I think based on those data, we can say that there's clear evidence of, of male reproductive toxicity um, and from multiple species um, and in multiple studies. Uh, so I'm just, Curious what other, if other panel members have different thoughts on that who haven't uh, had a chance to talk yet. Okay. 
Um, Dr. Breton, did you want to say something else or is your hand like? No, oh, I did actually. I was just going to sort of say um, that Dr. Allard had also mentioned when he was summarizing how there, you know, these key characteristics and, and was sort of questioning how many of them one needs to actually check off to, to sort of have sufficient evidence. And I just wanted to comment that like sort of my own interpretation when I was going through all of this was that, and from a snippet from the epi literature was like, I was under the, under the impression that basically as long as you hit one, you know, you had sufficient evidence. So I was kind I kind of wanted to raise that because I was curious what other people thought. Um, well, but that too, you know, I see Patrick shaking his head. But I know, I, mean, I know. See, so that's what I want to ask. But I'm sorry if you affect us, if you look at the, look, just look at how the NAS looked at um, did their systematic review of phthalates and male reproductive effects, they just looked, they looked at fetal testosterone levels and anogenital distance. And that, and that's just one, right. That's one of these key characters. That's a key characteristic. And that's, and that was, an, that evidence was sufficient to say it was a presumed male reproductive toxin. So right. I feel like if you affect testosterone levels, yeah. that's an upstream effect that's going to affect multiple downstream apical endpoints. Though I agree with you, it's it's interesting because usually we'd be like, oh, we're just arguing about whether there's a, a particular mechanism of effect. But I agree that the key characteristics allow you to think about a constellation of mechanisms, which is true that probably chemicals can influence multiple pathways. Well, so so for my like for me, I was looking at it even just with the epi literature, and and so even right. the epi literature is you know, it's, it's, you know, not as, I, I think we've all said, it's not as strong as we would have liked. I still would have concluded that, you know, it, it at least showed some evidence of the impaired sperm and, you know, oh, all right. and sperm and sper from that perspective and that that in and of itself was enough to actually meet the definition of, of male reproductive toxicity. So that's why I was kind of asking the question about sort of how many of these things does one feel like you have to have to have sufficient evidence um, and sort of posing that question, you know, to, to all to all of the members. Uh, Dr. Herspiziato, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, yeah, and, and I agree with Carrie actually, but you know, uh, and in fact, looking back at that Lopez Espinosa paper, um, just looking at the graphs they showed, you can see there's there there are some pretty strong trends around uh, testosterone. And and another endpoint that I just want to ask because I don't think I heard anybody else mention it, and I wondered exactly what its connection was with male reproduct reproduction, and that is insulin growth factor one that was studied in that in that and and in the same table next to testosterone. So, uh, um, I could someone explain to me it what what its relevance is for male reproductive toxicity. I thought it was, uh, it was very strongly, and it was in boys and girls, which was kind of interesting too, uh, clearly associated with PFNA in, in that study. Dr. Aller, did you have your hand raised? But that was not in response to that question. Oh, okay. That was <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> to follow up on Dr. Breton's, that's why I lowered my hand. Okay, I wasn't sure. <laughs> Nobody Does anyone knew. want to comment on that? Well, I think they know. said in the paper it was related to that, but I, it's true, it wasn't in the pathway present, in, nor am I not that familiar with it either. So maybe Oeha can comment on it. That's what I was just going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, I don't want to take away your power as the chair. So no, 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 that's that's thank you. But I also had that same question. I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Oh, okay. So there's there's a paper. I should have checked myself. So there's a paper. Testosterone increases insulin-like growth factor one and and insulin-like growth factor binding protein. It's a 1995 paper in the Annals of Clinical Laboratory Science. So uh, I guess it's the other direction that it it could have been via the testosterone increase in that study. Um, Thank you, Dr. Allard. Yeah, so I'm re-raising my hand now. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I agree with you, Dr. Breton, and, and uh, um, the comments that were made as well uh, by Dr. Woodruff. Um, it, it sort of depends on the endpoint, right? It seemed like some endpoint are so incredibly clearly reproductive toxicants that if you hit any of them, then it's okay. But like under, I think it was under the reproductive toxicant, DNA damage was mentioned. 
And for me, it depends where the DNA damage is caused, right? It's also that when you look at the data, some of it is stronger, some of it is a little bit weaker. And so, you know, it's weighing the strong endpoints, the weak endpoints, where do they fit in that table? And that's where for me it becomes a little bit murkier. Um, so I feel more confident when there's an overlap. I, at least that's the way that I personally use that table when there's an overlap of several endpoints and that at least, you know, it's not just one, but several of them and some of them are stronger. Um, and then that gives me more confidence, but I guess we can all use that table differently depending on how we feel about it. Yeah, and I think that was, I agree with that point that was just made about the, it depends on which cell, whether it's in the cells or tissues of the male reproductive system when you're looking at the key characteristics. So I think that's an important point to keep in mind. Um, doc, uh, Dr. Kim, I think you had a, Allegra Kim, you had a comment about the IGF, I think maybe. Yeah, um, <laughs> I think that we, if I, you know, if this is, I'm a little fuzzy on this right now, I apologize, but um, I think we talked about whether or not to highlight that and um, determine that it wasn't really closely enough related to male reproductive toxicity that we, that we didn't want, so that we didn't want to highlight it, that it's more of a developmental issue, but we, we didn't really discuss it um, for that reason. Can I ask you a question because I'm just looking at the document now and it talks about it for the animal studies, insulin-like growth factor, hormone receptor one, hormone receptor two in the uh, mice studies and in the, so are you, is it different in the humans or? So this is Martha, Sandy. I think um, Dr. Ling Hong Lee may have something he wishes to add. Okay. Uh, hi, actually, uh, I want to clarify a few issues on the NTP study, not on insulin. Okay, I, well, I, I can... before you do that, so I, I guess we'll say that, you know, there's always more for us to um, learn and, and the role of the insulin growth factor and male reproductive toxicity. Um, we're still, we're still learning. Um, so I guess we don't have any answers for you. I apologize. Um, I don't know if you'd wish to hear just a, a little perspective on the NTP study from Dr. Lee or not at this time. Uh, sure, Dr. Lee, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, I wanted to clarify a few issues regarding the NTP study. Uh, the NTP study actually is a, really a, a standard NTP high quality study. That study included five doses from 0.625 to 10 milligram per day. And they only measured certain parameters at three lower doses, 0 0.625, 1.25, 2.5. At the lowest dose, there was no effect on body weight. There was already significant effect on epididymal weight. If you look at the several endpoints, including histopathology, histopathology incidence, most parameters are dose dependent. I want to point that one out. Secondly, uh, immune reproductive toxicity testing, organ weight and histopathology, in many cases are the most sensitive parameter for male reproductive toxicity. In testes weight, usually people use, as well as indicated in the guideline, EPA guideline, absolute testes weight has always been used, not a relative. Same with the epididymal weight. If you look at the NTP data, I think it's, the effect uh, is clear. Certainly about the treatment duration, uh, NTP study treated the animals 28 days. That's about half of one full cycle of spermatogenesis in, in rodents. Uh, if you expose the animals longer than that, so what would you expect? Normally you, you would expect effective dose, uh, effect, effects at lower doses. And uh, Actually, the study by saying oh, the 90 day study supports that uh, you know, postulation. That study post exposed the animal for 90 days, then they, they observed the effect at 0.5 milligram per kilogram per day. And uh, 
So those are things I wanted to point out for you to consider. Thank you. Thank you, and Dr. Pessa, you've had your hand raised for a while. That's okay. Um, so just to follow up on Dr. Lee, I, I do agree with what you're saying, but um, there are dose response or concentration effect relationships, and then there are very weak ones or ones that require you to use your imagination. And I wanna point out that at 2.5 mg per kg per day, you're literally saturating all PK parameters. You're at saturation. At five mg per kg per day, you're not escalating the internal concentration, you're saturated. At the lowest dose, you're having only a few biological outcomes. And so really you have one data point to fit the dose response extrapolation. Uh, that to me is, is weak at best. And you can't build a adverse outcome pathway when the doses required in an animal study are completely orders of magnitude off from human exposure. We try to correct for this with uncertainty factors but just take a look at the math. The, the numbers are six orders of magnitude above. So let me ask you a different question. What if you were to pick five outcomes at random, at random, and put them in this dose escalation study that the NPT did? And what's the probability that because of nonspecific effects, those five parameters would show you the same trends? In toxicology, really the concentration and the dose do make the poison. And here you're escalating a dose in the saturation range where the body can't even deal with it. it, it, it it's, it's saturating all the PK values, uh, you know, processes, I should say. So that's where I'm coming from this in terms of how strong the animal data is to support what I feel is, yes, um, suggest suggestive data in the epidemiological study. In fact, if that's enough, then I'm, I'm on board. Uh, but you can't say that these animal studies have predictive value. I'm sorry. I have no comment, thank you, yeah. All right, any additional comments from the panel members? Okay, I'm not um, seeing any raised hands. And we're um, almost at 1230. So I will let, let us take a lunch break and I'll ask Carol Monaghan Cummings to give a Bagley Keene open meeting law reminder. And then also um, ask the uh, staff um, how long we should take for our lunch. <laughs> I just Hi, this is Sorry, quickly, that Dr. Pessa's hand is still raised, Dr. Luter. Hmm. Oh, I was assuming that. Okay, okay. thank you. <laughs> it, this is Martha okay. Sandy. In terms of lunch break, is would forty minutes be the right amount of time? You think that would be fine? Do we see any objections from the, anyone? <laughs> Okay, 40 minutes, so that would be at uh, 10 after one. Uh, Carol, want a hand Cummings? Right, there's just, um, I just wanna remind you what I said earlier about not discussing um, these issues outside of the meeting. And um, that includes phone calls, texts, uh, chats, all that. So uh, maybe just uh, chat about something else during lunch. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And enjoy your lunch. We'll see you back at uh, 10 after one. Bye-bye.